Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Latif, and welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, and this is episode 49. It is Tuesday evening. It's another rainy night. Um, I'm actually going to step outside in a little while, go on to the, get onto the porch, and just kind of kick back a little bit, do a little thinking. Um, it's a nice night. I'm... Uh, uh, you know, we had the show this weekend in Fresno was great. You know, everybody who followed along, uh, thank you so much. Everyone showed up to the show. Seemed like the entire Fresno was there. Uh, it was it was great, man. It was great. I'm I'm really really blessed and fortunate to be able to do what I do. I mean, it really is. You know, I really wish more people can experience, um, you know, what it is that we we deal with. You know, um. You know, hip-hop was always my thing. That's what got me into this whole business. I started out as a rapper going on the road with Little Susie. One of the first songs I, I wrote uh, was a song called um, Children of the World. It was on Little Susie's first album. It was actually the first cut because the it was gonna actually the album was going to be called Love, uh, Children of the World. Instead, they, uh, they named it uh, Love Can't Wait, which is where Take Me Arms is. But... I came up with the song because her f- parents, well, her father, who I worked with in Manhattan, uh, I was in my teens, <clears throat> I don't know, 18, 19, <clears throat> and he loved my writing. I did a lot of raps. I used to write a lot of raps. And he asked me if I ever tried writing a song song. I said, no, not really. Never never have. And I said, what are you looking for? So he had told me, well, you know, I want to get something for Susie. Um, she was like, I don't know, at that time, like seven years old, six or seven. He says, I don't know. He goes, I want to do something like, you know, a song about children, da, da, da. And I I saw this as an opportunity because she was quite popular in New York. This was before, this was even before Randy. This came out before Randy. And um, we ended up, I ended up writing, no, no, let me get this right. Let me make sure I'm getting this right trying to think because I wrote it was released on the Love Can't Wait album but I I wrote it earlier than that because she put that's what it was she performed it on Star Search so yeah so she was like seven years old so it was written a while back and it was um I think it was one of my productions I don't think it was uh no, it was the original production that's on... No, 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 I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I'm trying to remember. Remember, we're going way back. It was another production that we had done, done of the song. Um, and I remember I came up, he, he was talking about, you know, recording something about children. And I said, okay, well, let me, let me, let me, let me think about it. I never tried. And I came up with Children of the World. So if you guys ever, you know, if you have the first album or you can even find it on um, YouTube, just type in Children of the World, Lil Susie. And yeah, that was the, the song that I wrote and produced. Uh, I've produced the first copy, the first version. The second version, it was uh, co-produced. There was other producers involved. Um, but I'm st- I'm the sole writer on it. I think I gave credit to other people. That's just how that works. Um, and that's fine. It happens a lot. <coughs> it's just like when you see um, movies and they're produced by the artists. A lot of times, by the actors, a lot of times it's because... The actor came in at a discounted price, so what they do is they pay them what they can afford, uh, and then they give them producer credits. Doesn't mean they literally did anything, but they got the credit of a producer, or sometimes an associate producer, or a co-producer. If they put the money up there, executive producer, you know, so it goes like that. Executive producers usually own the product, you know. Um, That's usually how the deal is structured. But, um, and then... um, after that, um, I did a song called Get Up. I remember uh, Can You Feel the Beat for by Lisa Lisa had just come out and Susie's dad asked me, he goes, Hey man, can you can you write something 
similar to this, and I wrote a song called Get Up. And it had that, you know, just like, you know, can you feel the beat within my heart? This one had that same kind of fast, because it was like, get up off your seat, get up on your feet, move your body. So it had that kind of, same kind of feel. Um, I did the first production. Actually, I still have it. Susie won't give me promotion, uh, permission to to put it out there. <coughs> Though I would love to. One of these days. One of these days she'll let me. Um, and then we had uh, Louis Rivera and Michelangelo Caravello who reproduced it. And we put it right back out. But it, it never got released. We shopped it uh, to Fever, to Sal. And instead, um, Sal ended up uh, creating, uh, getting Andy to do, Andy Panda to do the Randy song. It was originally called Andy, but that was kind of creepy. So uh, they kept it at Randy. Um, and that was the first song that was released. It should have been Get Up. I think she would have done a lot better with Get Up, you know, thinking of it now. Because I, I didn't want to do a, a children's song. Randy was, you know, basically about a little girl who had a crush or whatever the case may be. Um, but uh, Get Up was... A, it was almost like a Jackson 5 kind of situation where though they were kids they were still knew about love and they were able to sing about it and that's what I wanted I didn't really want that bubblegum shit you know and uh but you know of course they overrode me and um they wound up releasing that song against you know most better judgments but apparently uh those people are known for making uh not making the best judgments as you can tell by uh their track record I mean they had great hits but kind of screwed up some of their bigger deals and I don't know, I don't know, a little messy. Anyway, um, so anyway, that's where my, um, that's where my whole, uh, uh, origin began. It began with hip hop. It began with rap, um, you know, rapping in, uh, you know, in the schools, um, at the proms. I remember getting kicked out of one prom because I had like an anti-education rap. And they, I remember everybody was excited. Teachers were excited. That I was going to rap. And I had my boy DJ Drac. This was in Queens, IS-145. And um, I started rapping. Everybody started kind of circling me. And it was kind of cool. Then I went to another song. I did this education rap. Um, and all of a sudden, they stopped me. And then they stopped. They said, no, no, we can't do that. So I started doing another song. And I went right back into the education rap. And I got escorted out of the, out of the gymnasium, you know. Um, but that was my, um, that's how I came in. You know, Susie's father was actually managing me. I used to open up for her. Yeah, you know, I said, you do this um, this little intro rap for her. Um, and then I said, get off. And then she used to perform. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting history, man. I mean, if I see where I went. Then I think sometimes I'm like, well, had I continued to pursue the hip hop thing? Because I was way ahead of the game, you know. <clears throat> Most people I knew weren't even rapping yet. I was already rapping. Um, I had moved from the Bronx to Queens, so um, though there was a lot of rappers in Queens, they weren't from my part of Queens. My part of Queens was like nerd city, you know. Uh, later on, it got a little crazy, but you know, when I first got there, it was like mostly Chinese and Indians and a lot of foreigners that that lived in that area. They were not really I, I i didn't meet any puerto ricans till like later on like years later some of them migrated in from like the bronx and stuff not so many puerto ricans um so you know so i had a, a pretty cool thing going on and i was excited man i used to love oh my god like i knew everything that was going on and i was writing and you know ll cool j rob bass you know i mean well if i go further back of course you know shigeho gang and then going into the whole def jam you know, Rob Bass, I mean, uh, L. Cool J, Run DMC, that whole, that whole crew. Um, those, those were like the main people that I really, really, that really inspired me um, to make it happen. And I was pushing in that direction. And I believe that eventually I would have, something would have kicked off for me. Because it was just a matter of time and I was very aggressive and I had tons and tons of raps and then even when I went away when I got locked up because that's what that's what started to happen I was actually on the road with Susie when I started to mess around with drugs and it kind of took everything from me and I remember because <clears throat> I, I remember I didn't I didn't um rehearse anymore I wasn't taking it serious um 
I remember getting drunk on stage one time. I wasn't a drinker, but I drank anything to get me high at that point. Um, and I was being warned. And not from, from like Tony or working with Susie and stuff, because they really didn't know what was happening. I kept it on the DL. They didn't really, I wasn't on the road. We were doing all the, the New York circuit. So when they saw me, they saw me for that day. I didn't have to spend the whole day or go to a hotel with them or nothing like that. It was just, I met them at the club or I met them at their house and we would go. And, you know, when I opened up for them at like Magique's, Crystal Cities, uh, a few a few venues that um, I opened up. Um, but I, I had a lot of, uh, a lot, there was a, I had a lot of potential. Could have been a contender. And then, of course, I got caught up in the whole whirlwind and I was taken out of the situation. I remember it came to a point too where, you know, uh, Susie's father wanted to get hold of some of my songs, wanted to see if there was anything in there that they can use for her. But, man, I didn't remember where any of that stuff was, you know? And, um, but when I came home, uh, you know, I stayed, I spent so much time, you know, trying to study about the business. You know, when, when you, I don't know about anybody else. When I'm interested in something, I tend to read and watch everything that has to do with it. I just, I just get obsessed. And when I was in Kosovo, it was the same thing. So they didn't have any like new books. Like you could go to a the library. They didn't really have new books on music and stuff. They had a lot of the older books. <coughs> like this big business of this big book of business and stuff like that. It was really detailed, but I would grab those books and I would read them over and over and over. And I was always a note taker. So I would take notebooks and I would teach myself, you know, really, really the formulas. And I remember drawing diagrams to understand the formula of, of the formula of royalty rates, how how the royalties are made, the difference within public, you know, what is a publisher? What do they do? How do they work with writers? And I started to really, really get deep and down, start really understanding the whole process of distribution. And um, But my main goal always was to come out and be an artist. But what was so funny is that when I came out, I realized that the knowledge I had, in my opinion at that point, and the business part of, of the business, of the music business, seemed to be more fascinating to me at that time. I, At that point, I... I and there was a lot of executives that were famous. So even that little um, that little touch of fame that I always desired, a lot of us desire, you know, um, I saw it being possible because you saw people like Russell Simmons, uh, Barry Gordy. You know, later on you found you know people like you know, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, P Diddy, and. Um, Jay Z, and you know, start seeing that the, the executives were becoming these famous people as well. Uh, so I saw that I, I could basically I could do both. This is where my two passions cross. My passion to be an artist was probably not really to be an artist, but maybe to touch people with my art. That was the key. It wasn't really to be an artist, but to touch people with my art. And I know this is true now as I'm older because of my writing. When I write something and it touches someone, or I create my little videos and it touches someone, I, I love it, man. It makes me feel real, real good. Um, so this was where these two things crossed. It was my desire to have this little fame or to be able to touch people with my art. And then also the new knowledge that I built about the business of music. So when I came out, um, one of the first things that I did is um, Susie's father called me in to the production of the Love Can't Wait album. So I sat in there. It was actually for uh, Children of the World, which was my song, and I saw when they put the chorus together, and and it was exciting. I, I stayed put. I, 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 um, I was fresh out of jail, so I wasn't trying to kick up no dirt. I, I, I allow pros to work, and I, so I sat back as the writer, observed, enjoyed, and just loved to love seeing my song being brought to life. And it was, you know, to be, to spend three years in prison to just dreaming about this and then coming out and now this is happening it was a great feeling and what's so crazy is that <coughs> excuse me in 
And during that time, I was at the Center for Media Arts. I was taking audio engineering. I was in audio engineering school. So I was learning also the technical and behind the scenes, not because I wanted to be an engineer or even a producer, but I wanted to know these things. I knew that if I learned this stuff, that if I could become an exec, I could really learn. You know, I could really, I'll, I'll be pretty much well-rounded in the in the music business. And so I went to Center for Media Arts, and it was during that time that they produced Children of the World. What was so great was I was the first person in my class to come back with a production that was a professionally done production um, of my own, <laughs> so it was it was pretty it was pretty cool, you know. Um, and then um, after that, I remember Susie pushing the album, and I remember when "Take Me in Your Arms" uh, kicked off. You know, when I first heard the song "Randy," that was on Fever. I was actually incarcerated. I was still in Queens House of Detention. And every night we all had Walkmans. So every night we would put, you know, put the mixes on at night, usually on a weekend night, like Friday night. And that'd be like a little hangout. It was, it was crazy because it would be like, it was crazy, man. I mean, the chill scene that I lived was nothing like you see on TV, I'll tell you, man. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, it was more like a club. It was, it was weird. It was weird. That's another story. But, um, and that was the first time I heard Randy, and I remember freaking out. And, you know, when you have people that pretty much don't know anyone who's done anything spectacular, and all of a sudden, why you're incarcerated? One of your biggest dreams actually comes true. Why you're incarcerated? Think about this. You know, I wanted my whole life to either get a job at a record company, or I couldn't even get a job at a record store, let alone a company. And then here I am, you know, you know, behind the scenes, I'm working with this artist, and she releases her first song. No, I'm sorry, but the song wasn't mine, it was Randy's. It was Randy. <laughs> but it was the artist that I was working with, and it was the deal that I was a part of that they ended up not using my song, using that one. And now, all of a sudden, here comes this song. Now, I wasn't really concerned too much about the success of that song, but I was very concerned about the success of the artist that was singing it. These people were like family to me. These people were the ones that were giving me this opportunity. So I was so, so freaking excited. You have no idea. And then to go and try to tell people and try to, um, you know, uh, you know, articulate exactly your feelings of how you feel, what you're going through at this moment. It was a little frustrating. It was a little like, oh, my God, they don't understand. They don't. Yeah, because they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. All right. OK, I'm like. You don't get it. You don't understand what I... It's been my dream for my entire life, you know? And it's true. You know, as an artist, my my desire to be an artist comes back from, like, when I lived in the Bronx as a child, which I didn't leave there until I was 10, and I can remember several years before that. So my first desire to wanting to be a singer, a singer, it was before rap, was I was, must have been about six, seven years old. And I used to, I love the Jackson 5. I just knew every one of their songs. And I, I used to perform them, you know, for my family when they used to come in. And I was pretty good. Because as I grew up, people still remember. People still tell me. They say, wow, you know, you were young. You had, I had nobody teaching my mom. My mom didn't know anything about any of this stuff, you know. You know, and, uh, and I remember, you know, coming out to the living room. My mom used to call me. When she had company over, I used to have to come out. I could come out, say hi to everybody, but then I had to get my ass to bed and not come out because it was family time. It was a grown-up time. You know, she didn't do it all the time, but she did maybe a couple times, you know, once every couple of months or something like that, and she would call me out, and she would go, sing band, and she would put the record player on with the little 45, and I would just sit there, stand there, kind of swaying back and forth with some sort of make, make-believe microphone. Sometimes it was just my fist, held underneath my mouth and I was like Been the two of us, me, uh, uh, and I would and I would sing it and and everybody would be looking now my sister makes fun of me she said nah man people used to smile because you were funny man your, your veins used to come out of your skinny neck and because I was real skinny <laughs> you know but I remember people you know when you start getting friends you know okay you know, people will make fun of you but I never to this day felt like anybody was making fun of me. Yeah, I probably was funny. 
was a skinny dude, you know, singing this Michael Jackson. I was skinny with bug teeth and big ears and, and singing this Michael Jackson song. And if somebody was seasoned me, I probably would have been dope, you know, because I, to this day, I, I think I could hold a little note. I ain't trying to sing, but I could hold a little note. I could definitely hear a, a bad note. So uh, artists have learned that from me. <laughs> you know, I know when you're going flat or you're going to sharp. I know when that when that's happening. So I had a pretty good ear growing up. <clears throat> and then when you have friends, especially girls, I'm talking about as a little kid. So I'm a little kid, maybe 10 years old. And we got teenage girls that are coming up and say, sing Ben for me. Sing. And I'm outside in the street and I'm singing them or I'm in my friend's and his older sister come on, you go sing for me. And yo, know, people are so people don't really want to hear. I don't think people want to really hear you if you sound because I don't remember people laughing. I don't I, I remember people standing there smiling, listening to me, you know. So as far back as I can remember, I had a really, really deep desire to be an artist. But you know what? Maybe it wasn't really to be a singer. Maybe it was just to be an artist because right now there's a lot of things that I do I feel pretty artistic. You know, I write books. That's an art form in itself. That's, you can't get more expression. You can't relay more expression than in a book. Not even a song can do that. I can still write music. I can still write, you know, lyrics for songs. Um, I do these little videos. You know, they tell stories. Um... I tell stories online. So I have, so maybe it wasn't me wanting to be a singer, but maybe it was just that desire to be an artist. That's why even, you know, as a booking agent, I'm a booking agent, but the bookings don't happen like they used to because a lot of people deal direct, okay? But I found myself now spending more time working on my own craft. And of course, my, my wife and little Susie is high, high, high prior, priority for me. So whatever they want, I got them, you know what I mean? So I, I'll put my own stuff to the side for them to, you know, uh, because they, they've they been a major, major part uh, of my career, huge part, you know, and I, I owe a lot of gratitude to them. But, um, but if it's not them, then it's my own art. It's the stuff that I'm trying to create so I can express myself and I can leave a legacy, you know, behind, you know. But like what I was saying is, you know, I had a deep, dark desire, deep desire to to be a rapper at one point. I mean, really, like, matter of fact, the, the new book that I have right now called Yes, Yes, Y'all kind of gives you the idea of how I was living and what I was trying to do. Um, how I ended up in freestyle was just like, and you got to, you know, yeah, maybe if I was, if I didn't get caught up in freestyle, I probably would have eventually found my niche in hip hop. And I probably would have, you know, seen my uh, my dreams come true. But, you know, things happen for a reason. I'm not going to regret that because even with freestyle, I'm, I'm very fortunate, man. I mean, life has really, really been great for me. You know, it's not about, okay, well, you know, freestyle artists aren't making the money that hip hop. Eh, it's not always about the money, man. It's not always about the money. If you can find your happiness and still pay your bills, you'll be much better off than someone who's making millions of dollars and who and who's miserable. Always keep that in mind. Don't always make it, don't always make the money priority. Money's good. It's not evil. Make your money if you could. But don't let that determine whether you're, you're happy or not. Don't let that be it. You know, make being happy your ability to Maybe change somebody else's life, even if it's your own children or your spouse. Are you able to change their life? Are you able to make them happy? Are you able to help them get from point A to point B in their life? You know, can you do that? You know, so anyway, that's it for now, guys. Um, just wanted to uh, reach out, chat with you for a few. Um, I put out a video. Um, it's about maybe 10 minutes, I think. Go on my Facebook page. It's also on my YouTube page. Um, it's called On The Road, and it's Fresno, California 2020. Um, me and Angel, and it's a little uh, behind the scenes. I'm going to do a, a few more of these. I have a bunch of this footage, uh, but I want to do fresh footage. So um, I did the one for Fresno. I'll be doing the next one. Check it out. 
um, there's a piece in there that's really funny where I'm actually vlogging. I've been vlogging for years, so it's nothing new. But there's a piece in there where I'm vlogging and um, in the middle of my vlog, Angel comes out the bathroom naked. <laughs> so <coughs> you got to check it out. It's in the it's in that one. So let me know when you see it. All right. Tell me what you think. <laughs> but anyway. OK, guys, listen, until tomorrow, be cool and good night, freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.